So it turns out technology went from being nowhere to everywhere in the course of just one human lifetime. Hmm. In class, I usually refer to this lecture as the speed of technology or how the future of humanity fundamentally changed over the course of just a single human lifetime. Um, and I find it sort of a, a tremendously interesting topic because it can be illustrated in perfect parallel with just my own life. Um, and the way I sort of frame this up is I, I think back to the movie Watchmen, which love it or hate it, you know, it, it was a, a comic book movie that existed. It, I think it came out in 2009. Um, but it did a pretty good job stylistically, at least to me, to take a character who is just fundamentally impossible to relate to. So the character of Dr. Manhattan, he, he essentially is a scientist who wanders into this weird device that just sort of quantumly eviscerates him and tears all of his matter apart. And he, by sheer force of will, sort of reconstitutes himself back into a being again. And when he does, he is godlike and omniscient can see forwards and backwards and just fundamentally not like a human um but they take this character who by any stretch of the imagination should be completely unrelatable um and makes him relatable in this beautiful montage in the in the middle of the movie that sort of plays out very slowly as he sort of methodically recounts his life and what of events led up to what caused him to be the way he is um and I found this sort of methodical retrotting of time to be a very effective way to lay the groundwork for something that has way more gravitas than you might think at a surface level. Um, and this isn't to say that like I myself am godlike in any particular way or have the ability to see forward or backward in time, um, but I do think that myself and people born in a very limited window around my age uh, have a very unique perspective into technology and the shape of humanity as it relates to technology uh, in a way that just other generations and other people won't have. And the reason that is is because um, a lot of times we're referred to as the Oregon Trail generation, or I believe the, the official name is Xennial or Xennial, I don't know how you pronounce it. Um, but it's really the idea that it's a neurolinguistic term for people who were born between 1977 and 1985. I happen to have been born in 1982, so I'm even, you know, directly within the range that they're defining there. Uh, and it's people who sort of sit between Generation X and the millennial uh, generational breakdowns. Um, and people who are Xennials or Xennials or the Oregon Trail generation usually um, are defined by feeling like they don't really fit in any particular group. And just coming from a place of personal experience, I would say that that's true. Uh, but for me, the reason I think that that's super important, especially as it relates to technology, is that if you look at sort of the, the broader picture of technology as it relates to humanity, we kind of had a whole lot of nothing from the Stone Age, effectively all the way up until like 1977, 1985 time window. Um, where we went from you know the agricultural re revolution to the industrial revolution um, but we didn't really start getting into that computer age and information revolution until the late 70s early 80s um, and that's the period in time when people such as myself were born so from kind of 1977 to 1985 forward uh, till today you have people who were coming to their maturation and living their life lock in step with sort of the technological revolution. So in 1982, the year I was born, you kind of have like the inception of the internet. Uh, and if you just look at charts like this one here, I mean, you've got like the, the internet's born, you got eBay, Java, AOL, Facebook, Bing, Tumblr, YouTube, like everything just starts to explode exponentially from that period onward. Um, and if you know anything about sort of psychological development in humans and when people generally start to experience their adolescence and they go through all these stages of finding balance between sort of chaos and organization or expressing expressing their individuality asserting their independence managing self-control all of these things regarding how you manifest as a person in the society at large um, people born between 77 and 85 were basically coming to terms with how they're going to behave in the world 
while this insane technological revolution was really doing the same thing in many effects. Um, so the way I, in, in sort of a more philosophical term, what's interesting to me is that this whole idea that like if you interviewed a, a butterfly sitting on the branch of a sequoia tree and you said, do you perceive the object on which you're standing to be alive? It would say, of course not. It's been here my whole life and it hasn't done a thing. Um, that's kind of the vibe I get from anyone you know, definitely a generation below me, but anyone even five to ten years away from me uh, tends to treat technology in this way of like, it's ubiquity. It's always been there. It's been a part of their life. Um, and psychologically, we, we, have, we have a hard time sort of understanding or conceptualizing a time when life wasn't this way. Um, and that can be true from, you know, how you deal with interacting with information, whether you turn to the internet to look it up, um, or anything like that, but really, if you did not sort of come to your maturation while this was happening, you either have a viewpoint of like somebody much older than me, um, where I've tried to explain this concept and I generally get the, the response of like, yeah, tech acceleration is super weird because most modern things are weird. It, it's this idea that like, you know, we went from the horse and buggy to the car, to the airplane, to, to the moon launch, and Things like the internet are just sort of lumped in with that, even though they are orders of magnitude more severe than those changes uh, that happened previously. Um, and then the more younger generation, I've actually had people tell me that I just talk like I'm high all the time. Um, and to me, I don't necessarily take that as like a slight or an insult, but just as like the concepts are so deep and esoteric and philosophical that people can't even wrap their mind around them. They're like, I need to be on drugs to like be at the level you're trying to discuss. Um, and you know, at, at one level of analysis, that's humorous, but at another level, it shows that just like, I fundamentally don't align with what you're talking about. Like it, it just seems like a, a layer away from where I'm thinking currently. Um, so really the whole purpose of this talk is to sort of reconcile those two viewpoints. Um, and there, there's a, bit of stand-up comedy by Pete Holmes, and he, he comes from the same window of time that I'm talking about here. Um, and he, he frames it up as like, there used to be a time when people didn't know stuff. Um, and when you didn't know, it just caused this deep rift in your being that like you could go on for weeks without knowing something. But there was a time that if you didn't know where Tom Petty was from, you just didn't know. <laughs> And you felt that yearning and that deficit in your being. And then when you finally did come out to learn it, it just washed over you with a wave of importance and gravitas that just doesn't happen anymore. Because with the internet, we essentially have taken the concept of knowing and the concept of not knowing something and just smashed them together. Uh, I believe in his example, he says like he was laying in bed and he wondered where Tom Petty was from, and he just sort of casually pulled out his phone, and then there you go, it was from Florida. Um, but the period between not knowing and knowing has gotten so short that no one really is building wisdom anymore. We're more we're just sort of transactionally able to spit out information with zero context and sort of zero tethering to the reality that produced it. Um, I would encourage you to go watch the whole video from him. It's, it's funny, I just would try to avoid putting other people's copyrighted material in my work if I can. So that's the summation of it, but feel free to go watch it. But this whole idea of like knowing and not knowing have become the same thing is really at the crux of all of the issues I see when trying to teach younger generations where it's like no one takes notes, no one asks questions. There's this like philosophical difference with thinking that any piece of information can easily be regathered or re-gleaned from the internet or from somewhere else, um, even to the extent of getting questions about an assignment at one in the morning. Like there, there fundamentally is a, a presupposition there that like if the student is working at one in the morning and they have a question, they should be able to get the answer from the instructor at one in the morning right when they need it. Um, I've even had kids come to class who are like, oh, I sent you a question, but you didn't respond, so I didn't go any farther. Like, the expectation being that since I didn't answer at one in the morning, they were unable to go ahead in the project. And, you know, say whatever you want about people's work ethics, but I, that's just a fundamentally different way of thinking about how to approach a task than people born prior to the internet age. 
Um, so in grappling with this idea of sort of knowing and not knowing, um, and just buttressing that against that whole idea of like, you talk like you're high all the time, um, I wanted to try to reinstill this idea of wonder and curiosity and like deep profound longing for new information to people who might not necessarily have it. So if, if you were born after the age, or after the year 1985, maybe this will have more of an impact on you. Um, but I just want to show you sort of how technology played out as it relates to the world over the course of a human lifetime, because it aligns pretty much part and parcel with my life in a very sort of interesting and weird way. Um, so that said, let's take a trip through time. The year is 1969. Robert and Mary meet each other. ARPANET 4 is launched. It connects four locations. A local newspaper is cited as saying, this represents a new era and what computers might be like in the future. Um, the rough diagram of what that looks like is here. The number of transistors on a CPU, the number of essentially independent calculations that it can make at any given time is zero. They have not been invented yet and will be invented in 1971. Between 1974 to 1975, Robert and Mary travel together uh, through California and other various places. Bill Gates and Paul Allen found Microsoft back when it had a hyphen in it. Um, the Altair 8800 computer is launched and the number of transistors per CPU is 4500. It's the Intel 8080. The year is 1976. Mary and Robert decide to get a dog, settle down a little bit. At the Apple One is introduced. It has an 8-bit processor and 4K of RAM. It was introduced into the market at the weirdly satanic sounding 666.66 uh, price point and was the first computer to really use the RAM model. The number of transistors per CPU is 8,500. 1977, Robert and Mary decide to start a family and their once puppy sized dog is now quite large. The Commodore PET is released. It looks very much like the computers we know today. It's one of the first ones to take that form factor. It still has 4K of RAM. The Apple II is released. It has a blistering one megahertz CPU and four megs of RAM. The number of transistors per CPU is 8,500. 1980, Robert and Mary have their third child, my sister Holly. MS-DOS is created. This is the non-graphical command line OS that sort of drives the backbone of all uh, Microsoft computing, um, all computing back then, essentially. It's the backbone of all computing to come. The number of transistors per CPU, 29,000. 1981, Robert and Mary attend Deer Park Funland, which for people who live in Michigan or the surrounding area, is what came to be known as Michigan's Adventure. You literally could just do like bumper cars and go look at literal deer. That's why it was called Deer Park Funland. Uh, the Xerox Star is released. The first GUI is invented or graphical user interface, and this inspires the design of all computers as we know it. The IPv4 standard is published. This establishes a communication protocol for the modern internet. If you've ever seen a four, four, or four numbers separated by periods between the zero and 255, those are IPv4 IP addresses. Number of transistors per CPU, 1, 000, or 125,000 average. 1982, I am born. This is when stuff starts to get super weird. So Time Magazine names the computer the person of the year. Number of transistors per CPU, 134,000. In this same year, I come home from the hospital. The first CD is created. Apple is the first tech company to hit a billion in annual sales. The first computer virus is created by a 15-year-old. Word Perfect is released. It becomes a word standard profit, the standard word processing software. The Commodore 64 is released. Sony sells its first CD players. AutoCAD is introduced. Tech companies that get founded include Sun, Electronic Arts, Adobe, Autodesk, LucasArts, Symantec, and the number of transistors per C CPU is 134,000. 83, I am one. 
the Apple releases the Apple IIe. It has 64K of RAM and cost $1,395 or $3,500 adjusted for inflation. The Air Force signs a 1.2 billion, that's a B, um, contract for the production of a 28 GPS block satellite uh, rock, with Rockwell Space Systems. This is sort of the foundation of all GPS as we know it today. The number of transit transistors per CPU leaps to 40,760. Uh, there's a couple different processors or specs there that relate to that. 1984, IM2. I look weirdly like my son at that age. You know, genetics are crazy. Um, Apple releases the iconic 1984 commercial for Macintosh. The 3.5 floppy disk is invented, which is still the save icon, which we use this very day. And notable companies that are founded are Dell and AT&T as we know it today. The number of transistors per CPU goes to 63,000. 1985, I'm three. First internet domain name gets registered at symbolics.com. You can still go there. It's like a hilariously garbage website, but uh, very historic if nothing else. Steve Jobs quits Apple and the Nintendo Entertainment System is launched in the US. So the NES, as all of our, all of our uh, United States friends have kn know it, uh, starts to exist. Number of transistors per CPU jumps to 275,000. 1986. I am four. IBM releases its first laptop. It weighs 12 pounds. IBM.com comes online and notable companies that get founded are D-Link, Avid, Bethesda, Gigabyte, JVC, MSI, Pixar, and Ubisoft. Number of transistors. Uh, the prevalent one at the time dipped to 30,000. Needless to say, the previous one still existed, but for comparability's sake. 1987, I am five. The VGA cable standard is invented. This cable is still the one that exists on most devices I connect to today, which is insane. Um, but just goes to show you how, how much that technology embedded itself into uh, our lives. The first version of Excel debuts. The GIF file format is invented. So not animated GIF, but just um, graphic interchange format is invented. And number of transistors per CPU goes to 273,000 with the Motorola 680 030, or sorry, 68030. 1988 to 1990, I am six, seven and eight. Tim Berners-Lee proposes the hypertext system, which is the start of the internet as we know it. He later sets up the first web server at info.cern.ch, which is effectively the first website ever created. The Navstar GPS system becomes operational for the government, and that's the, the 28 um, satellite system mentioned a couple years ago. Number of transistors per CPU jumps to 1,200,000. And as it relates to us designers out there, Photoshop 1 is released. So the career that I'm in now effectively kind of took hold and started when I was seven. 1991, I am nine. I'm wearing this super cool Bart Simpson sweatshirt. The internet becomes public facing. So you get, um, Sort of the first Internet of Things term is coined, and the number of transistors leaps to 1.3 1, 1. million. 1992, I am 10. Microsoft sells 2.1, or Microsoft Windows 2.1 is released. It sells 1 million copies in the first two months. The first SMS text message is sent, and it just says, Merry Christmas. Photoshop 2.5 uh, is released, and this is the first Mac and Windows version. Number of transistors holds steady at 1.3 mil. 1993 to 1994, I am 11 and 12. 1993, 50 websites are published total. Uh, Doom is introduced and the Intel Pentium uh, platform of processors is, is released. 94, CSS is created as you know it uh, today for modern websites. Photoshop 3.0 is released. Number of transistors leaps to 3,100,000. 1995, I am 13 and make this super dope collection of dominoes. Dot, the dot com boom starts, Amazon.com opens, eBay.com opens, Internet Explorer 1.0 debuts, Windows 95 launches and sells a million copies in four days. The number of transistors per CPU leaps to 5.5 million with the Intel Pentium Pro. 
this is when things start to get going so fast I couldn't even quantify all of the different things that happened, so it gets kind of bullet pointy. 1996, I am 14, Google gets founded, email overtakes regular mail by volume, and IMDB and MySpace debut. That's Google the company, not the website. Number of transistors, 4.3 million. 1997, Steve Jobs comes back to Apple, Wi-Fi 802.11 standard gets invented, that held true for a very long time. Uh, IBM's Deep Blue wins its very first chess game. Number of transistors, 8.8 .8 million. 1998, I am 16. Windows 98 gets released, Photoshop 5 gets released, PayPal and Rockstar Games get founded. Number of transistors, 7.5 million. 1999, the Melissa virus causes 80 million in damage globally. The RIAA, that's the Recording Industry Association of America, begins suing everybody and their brother for using Napster and distributing MP3s to each other. Um, and the first BlackBerry phone is introduced. Number of transistors, jumps suddenly to 27,500,000. Then we hit the year 2000 with the whole Y2K nonsense and everybody afraid that computers are going to, you know, drop planes out of the sky because we didn't include four digits when accounting for the year. Needless to say, nothing happened. Um, but in the year 2000, I am 18. More than half of Americans have the internet. Google launched AdWords for the first 350 customers. Intel breaks the one gigahertz barrier with CPUs. The number of transistors leaps to 42 million. 2001, I'm 19. Apple introduces iTunes, much to the groan of the world. Uh, AOL memberships pass 28 million. Google image search is introduced. So to give you an idea, I was just sort of entering college and our ability to find images and roughs for designs had just effectively started and Google Images wasn't even really a thing until our first year. Number of transistors per CPU held steady at 42 million. 2002, PayPal gets bought by eBay. Photoshop 7 is released. This is the one that I start learning on. Uh, and LinkedIn.com goes online. Transistors leaps to 55 million. 2003, I'm 21. The iTunes Store is launched, Android is founded, and WordPress is released. Number of transistors leaps to 105 million. 2004, Gmail is announced. Thought of as an April Fool's joke upon initial release. Um, Firefox 1.0 is released and Gateway closes its retail stores. I only mention that because Gateway was our first computer. Um, by today's standards, it was a total dinosaur, but I remember trying to convince my dad that it was just like the bleeding edge thing and we had to have it. Um, so, you know, props to you, dad, for indulging me, but it was a total piece of crap by today's standard, and we paid way too much for it. But this was sort of the my entry into this technological stuff in 2004. Um, was our first gateway computer, um, so I'll always remember that brand. Number of transistors, 112 million. 2005, YouTube is founded. First video gets uploaded. Reddit is launched, and Adobe purchases Macromedia Flash. I am 23. Transistors hits 169 million. 2006, I am 24, Twitter launches, Google buys YouTube for 1.65 billion, and Amazon AWS opens. That's the web services that hosts the majority of websites and larger uh, commerce operations on the internet as of today. Number of transistors hits 220 million, so again, almost a precipitous doubling there. 2007, the iPhone is launched, the very first one, the netbook is introduced, um, and Three robots deployed in Iraq kill people with machine guns. That's the first uh, time that a computer, technically speaking, kills someone or murders somebody at a distance without intervention from another human, which is just sort of a technological, philosophical, and moral sort of cornerstone for us to remember as a society. So I thought it was worth including. I am 25. Sorry, number of transistors per CPU leads to 411 million. 2008, Blu-ray becomes the video standard. Hulu, Spotify, and Airbnb are launched. The iPhone 3G and Google Chrome are released. Transistors leaps to 731 million. 2009, I'm 27. Bitcoin is introduced. Facebook overtakes MySpace, and both are relevant. Um, and Minecraft is released. Number of transistors per CPU. 900 million. 
Uh, I include that photo because it was one of the first times that I saw my design work out in the wild, which was always kind of fun. Um, 2010, iPad and Instagram are launched. Microsoft releases the Kinect for Xbox 360. Mark Zuckerberg is Time's Person of the Year, and he's not sort of universally hated, which was interesting. Uh, I am 28. Transistors, for the first time, breaches a billion. That's with a B. Um, so this is very, uh, very integral to sort of the inflection point of how fast computers are getting. So 2010, transistors breaks a billion. 2011, I'm 29, Chromebooks launch. Watson, uh, the AI, beats two, two of the best humans at Jeopardy. That was Ken Jennings and some other guy. Apologies, other guy, I don't remember your name. And Netflix begins video streaming. Transistors per CPU again doubles to 2,270,000,000. 2012, I am 30. I'm having various health issues and this was all, the only photo I could find. Facebook passes a billion users. Lyft, Google Drive, Google Play are launched. Photoshop, Photoshop CS6 gets launched. Transistors, 2.7 trillion. Or sorry, billion. 2013, Yahoo buys Tumblr, and both are weirdly relevant still. Hotmail becomes Outlook.com. Um, Skype uh, joins Microsoft. PS4 is released. Adobe kills the program Fireworks, and Windows 8.1 is released. The number of C transistors per CPU is 5 billion. This is also, coincidentally, the year I met my wife. 2014, I am, thir I am 32. I get married to my lovely wife. Reddit passes 170 million users. iPhone 6 gets released, and the and Google acquires DeepMind, the uh, AI company that will later make AlphaGo, which is probably in a number of my other videos. The number of transistors per CPU goes to 5.5 billion. 2015, Windows 10 is released. A drone makes the first government-approved delivery of a product uh, without a human physically being there, and Verizon buys AOL for $4.4 billion. Transistors jumps to $7.1 billion. 2016, Samsung cancels the Note 7 after it starts blowing up in people's pockets. Twitter, Spotify, Netflix, Reddit, and PayPal all get ddos This is kind of one of the first forays into major companies getting uh, a denial of service attack on the internet and things going down. Microsoft releases the HoloLens. Number of transistors, 7.2 billion. 2017, I am 35. OpenAI wins at Dota 2, which is a very deeply complex uh, strategy game. Um, AMD announces the Threadripper processors, which as of 2019 right now, like AMD is just killing it with their whole Threadripper and Ryzen lines of processors. That It's a good time to be on Team Red. Um, Google, the Google Assistant launches on Google devices. Number of transistors does a very about face doubling once again, all the way up to 19 billion. 2018, I am 36. Cambridge Analytica steals 50 million Facebook account date, Facebook users account data, and starts the whole, uh, or gets caught, I should say, and gets all wrapped up in the whole 2016 election nonsense. Um, the GDPR goes into effect in the EU. That was a general data protection regulation law that was determining how businesses could conduct the acquisition and retaining of consumer data. And Microsoft acquires GitHub. Number of transistors jumps to 23.6 billion. And 2019, the year this video was recorded, I am 37 and all sorts of weird tech is being debuted at things like CES. You've got ultrasonic power, um, everybody talking about 5G wireless technology, and Bell unveiled an electric flying taxi, which, like, what the hell? That's all insane. Um, but the number of transistors per CPU as of the recording of this video is very much seeming like it's about to top out just by the physical laws of nature, which I'll cover in another video. Um, but the whole idea there being like, we can't keep doubling because the, the size at which we are making the individual transistors is so tiny that the electricity just starts moving around in almost a quantum-like way that we can't control if we make them any tinier. So to some extent, we've, we've hit the, the level of the universe at which we can scale these things. Like we've made them as small as physically possible. 
Um, and so what, what I'm seeing now, at least again, as the recording of this video, is a lot of companies coming out with chiplets or sort of chipsets where you have individual discrete processors packaged together where this processor handles the video, this one handles the audio, this one handles small tasks, this one handles big tasks, and that's their way to get around this idea that the processor itself has been optimized ad infinitum to the point where we can't make it any faster. Um, so we basically went from the moment I was born in 82 without having processors to 2019 where I'm 37 sitting before you and we've hit the extent of the universe, which is insane that things progress that fast. Um, but all that is to say, like by recap, you know, I'm born 134,000 transistors per CPU. I'm kind of awkwardly, I think that's like the age of eight, 100 or 1.3 million. Then you've got me kind of in my late teen, early adolescent or late adolescent years. We have 112 million. And then where we are today, we have 23 billion transistors per CPU. And there I am with my two kids who are just sort of starting into this wild ride. Uh, and the whole idea is just like the speed of technological progress is insane. And if you if you don't feel like it is, it's probably because you're either shot out one end where it didn't really matter or shot out the other where it's so ubiquitous, you didn't see it kind of unravel in front of you. Um, so to give you kind of a bellwether for that, in 1982 when I was born, the sort of be all end all of cool tech was the little Walkman shown there. Um, and if I were to tell you what the, the coolest tech invention is of 2019, I wouldn't even know where to begin. There's just so many. Um, <clears throat> and so when I teach, show this information in class, I usually try to frame it up as like, there's about a 15 year difference as of the recording of this between me and my students. And so 15 years before I was born, you have videos like this. A year to remember, a scene to remember. Sir Francis Chichester was almost home. I mean, that's back when people were saying stuff like, ain't she a dandy? And, you know, women in the workforce, what's that all about? Like, it was just a deeply archaic and not technologically progressive time. And that was only 15 years prior to my birth. You leap 15 years ahead from my birth and you get videos like this. The Fujix Nikon Hybrid looks nothing like a standard camera. This is the, the new B2 stealth bomber of digital cameras. At a cost of over $20,000, the Fujix Nikon uses removable PCMCIA style hard drives of up to 131 megabytes and will store up to about 70 images. Which, not to say anything of the hilarious sort of hip, cool dude editing and weird, weird uh, music of that clip, but in the late 90s, even like digital cameras were starting to take over, but they were so archaic. You had a camera that effectively had the same resolution as a iPhone 3 and it cost $20,000. So even just little incremental time, like 15 years in either direction, I've just had shown these tremendous swings in technological progress. Um, and so sort of just to recap, the key takeaways here are just like, be amazed by this stuff. Like it is insane. Um, like literally everything, the, the, the foundations of the society we live in are changing. Um, and it would be in your best interest to be both engaged and interested in how that's changing. Um, and then second is just have a sense of wonder. Like I, it hurts me to no end to see younger people without this sense of wanting to know something. They, they, they kind of settle for not knowing things because you can always just look it up later or who really cares if you don't know something? You can always, you know, settle any dispute by just Googling the answer with somebody. Um, but I would say by like researching and investigating and being curious, it just opens up this whole other world to you of not just transactional knowledge, but like deep, profound changes in society are happening. And you don't need to seem, you don't need to be high to appreciate how sort of weird and fundamental those changes are. I think if you're a naturally curious person, you can use the internet in a, a very, like almost visceral way to just acquire knowledge in a way that was not possible for younger generations, or older generations, I apologize. So the fact that that came to be while I was sort of figuring out my place in the world makes me behave with the internet in a very different way than I see younger people. And it just, I, you know, like I said, it kind of kills me. I wish more people would use the internet to learn new languages or, you know, teach themselves 
quantum physics for all I know, whatever. But just there's there's a wealth of information there at your fingertips and it doesn't all have to be like cat memes and you know, being a troll or generally miserable on the internet. So that said, that's kind of what I call the speed of technology. The sort of the, the speed of it just blows my mind every day. Um, if you like this lecture or like more of these sort of weird long form videos, feel free to like and subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff, and I will see you at the next one.